Okay. So then take home quiz question number five. Take home five, take home quiz five, question number five. Okay, so I gave you a function f of x is x cubed over 1 plus x to the fourth. Right, and I supplied for you the graph of this function. The graph of the function looks something like this. <coughs> okay, let's try and draw it here. <laughs> so it's sort of goes down and then up and then flat and then up and then down so it's a graph that looks a little bit like that so then I give you a situation I say okay I want you to go out to the right from the origin and choose some value t okay, so here's t and also symmetrically on the other side of the origin to negative t. Okay, then corresponding to each one of these is a point on the graph, so like that point and this point. Okay, and then those two points on the graph, right between those two points on the graph, you can make a secant line. So for example, like so. So there's a variety of such secant lines a variety of such secant lines. So here's an example of another one. So like this one, oops, <coughs> this one, and this one. Okay, so then what I'm doing is I'm symmetrically putting points on either side of the origin and constructing this secant. Okay, so now the question was, the instruction was, find which one of these secants has the greatest slope? Right, so how about between the two that I have drawn, the red one and the pink one, which has greater slope? The red one. Right, the red one has a greater slope than the pink one. So if I was to continue moving the points away from the origin, right and left, symmetrically, would the slope be increasing or decreasing? It'd be decreasing, right? It'd be decreasing. But I told you to find the maximum slope. So so it must not be that you're supposed to be going to the right. It must be that you're supposed to be, you know, going toward, toward the center. Okay. So then now the first thing we need to do is find the slope of such a secant line. Right? Find the slope of such a secant line. So then the slope of a secant line for a given t is this. I'll call the, the function g of t. This will give me the slope. And it will be f of t minus f of negative t. f of negative t. Divided by t minus negative t. Because these points right here, this point right here is T, neg uh, t f of t, right, and this point right here, this point right here is negative t f of negative t. So the slope of the, the, the secant line is the difference of the y coordinates divided by the difference of the x coordinates, right? rise over run. Okay, so any question on why this is, this is it? This is, this function g gives you the slope of the secant line for a given t. <clears throat> All right. So then now I can start simplifying things. So g of t is equal to, OK, so f of t would be t cubed over 1 plus t to the fourth, and then minus negative t cubed over 1 plus negative t to the fourth. Okay, and then all of that will be divided by t minus negative t. So t minus negative t, that's what? 2t. Okay, so then we can continue now. G of t is, so now, negative 
negative t all cubed, this term right here, well, that negative, I'm going to apply it with multiplication three times, so that is the same as negative t cubed. Okay, how about negative t all to the fourth? What is that? Just t to the fourth, because that's an even exponent. So then after that consideration, in the numerator, you get 2t cubed over 1 plus t to the fourth divided by 2t. Right, this 2t is that 2t. And then after one more simplification, we can say that this is g, to, uh, g of t is. Okay, so then now, instead of dividing by this, I could multiply by its reciprocal. So how about 2t cubed over 1 plus t to the fourth multiplied by 1 over 2t? Okay, so then this is, the twos will cancel, one t will cancel, so then this is t squared over one plus t to the fourth. Okay, so then now, this is in, this is in comparison, I want you to see what the purpose of this question was. On the previous questions, I said, here is a function, find its maximum, right? That's, that's the way that some of the previous questions went. This question was, here is a situation. I, from this situation, I want you to get a function and then find its maximum. So can you see that this, what the purpose of this question is, is I made it one step removed, right? Instead of giving you, here is the function, find its maximum. I said, here is a situation. You find the function that applies to this situation and then find its maximum. Does everybody see, from a teaching point of view, the purpose of this question? Okay. So then now that we have g of t, <clears throat> the whole purpose is to find its maximum. Okay. Find the maximum slope. So we want to maximize g of t. And because g of t is the slope of the secant. So someone give me an idea about how to do that. How do you do that? With a derivative, right? You find where the derivative of g is 0. Because where the derivative of g is 0, that could be at the bottom of a valley, but that would be a minimizer. Or it could be at the top, right? and that would be a maximizer. And so then, in order to do this, we're going to find the critical numbers. So find the critical numbers of g of t. So then, in order to do that, the derivative of g, well, this is a quotient. g is a quotient, so to compute its derivative, I'll use the quotient rule. So it will be 2t, 1 plus t to the fourth, minus t squared, times 4t cubed over 1 plus t to the fourth squared. Right, that's the quotient rule. Okay, so then we'll simplify this. So then this will be what? 2t plus 2t to the fifth minus 4t to the fifth divided by 1 plus t to the fourth squared. Okay, so then that's 2t uh, plus 2t to the fifth minus 4t to the fifth. So that's 2t uh, minus 2t to the fifth divided by 1 plus t to the fourth squared. Okay, so then now, normally if I was only asking you to compute a derivative, then I would say stop here, please. Okay, but we're going to continue doing things with this derivative, so I'm going to continue doing algebraic simplifications. So in the numerator, I can see that a common factor is 2t. So I can factor out 2t and say that this is 2t, uh, 1 minus t to the fourth over 1 plus t to the fourth squared. Okay, now, 
1 minus t to the fourth also cancels, or also not cancels, but uh, simplifies is what I mean to say. So continuing down here, g of the derivative of g of t is equal to 2t. And then how does 1 plus t to the fourth factor, or 1 minus t to the fourth factor? Right, 1 plus t squared multiplied by 1 minus t squared. And then over 1 plus t to the fourth, uh, 1 plus t to the fourth squared. Okay, so now this is uh, maybe just even one more, right? I could say that this is 2t multiplied by 1 plus t squared multiplied by 1 minus t multiplied by 1 plus t over 1 plus t to the fourth. Okay, so now we got carried away with all of this very careful considerations. But what, what was it that we were doing here? We were finding the, the critical numbers, right? So the critical numbers is where the derivative is what or what? Undefined or zero. So then how about let's consider, is there anywhere that g of t is undefined? Well, I'm dividing by something. I always get a little bit antsy. Right, when I'm dividing by something. Can there be any problem with that division? Okay, can there be any problem? No, there cannot be a problem, and why not? Right, so then that's 1 plus t to the fourth. t to the fourth is greater than or equal to 0. And 1 plus t to the fourth is greater than or equal to 1. It can't be any smaller than 1. So there's no way that you can divide by 0. It's not possible. So then, there are, no, there are none in this category. <coughs> OK. So then, how about is there anywhere that the derivative is equal to 0? Is there anywhere the derivative is equal to 0? So that's the same thing as saying that the numerator is 0. So then I could say that I want to solve the equation 2t multiplied by 1 plus t squared multiplied by 1 minus t multiplied by 1 plus t is 0. Okay, so then now, this 1 plus t squared, does it offer any solutions? No, because it can never be 0. Okay, how about 1 minus t? Does that offer a solution? Yes, so t could be equal to 1. Okay, how about this other one? t could be negative 1. Uh, but here's now something that's just a little bit tricky. How about this? Can this give you a 0? And the answer is no. Why can't it? What is g? What does g represent here in this problem? So the slope of a secant line. The slope of a secant line between two different points, right? Between positive t and negative t. If I choose t is 0, is that two different points? No, it's not two different points. So then one thing you need to see in this problem is that this, of course, right, is the slope of the secant line for a given t. Right? What is the domain? A given t which is positive. A given t which is positive. OK, so then really there's only one critical number. And what is it? The only critical number is t is 1. That's the only critical number there is. <coughs> okay? So then now, how could, you, how could you show that this is a maximizer instead of being a minimizer, say? Because it's important, right? What if you're in a business and you're, your boss, or you, right? Maybe you're the boss, and you say, you or someone says to you, I want to maximize our profits. So I'm going to find a critical number. OK, I found a critical number. And then after doing these operations according to the critical number you found, you realize, oh, actually, that critical number was a minimizer. So I've been minimizing my profits for the last month. Uh, I'm fired, right? Great. OK, so then how do you show that this is a maximizer?
Okay, so then there is a way using the second derivative that we haven't talked about yet. There's a way using the second derivative, but we haven't talked about it yet, so let's, let's use uh, something using the first derivative. How can you tell if a point is a maximizer, if a critical number is a maximizer? A slope chart, right? If you make a slope chart, and at that critical number, the function increases and then decreases, right, then it's at the top of a hill. And it's at the top of a hill. So then we have something that looks like this. We could draw. Okay, so if you look at the slope chart, you say, all right, um, we found this one critical number at t is 1. Oops. At t is 1. And over here, we can't go to there, right? t is 0. So I need something between 0 and 1, so how about a half? And something to the right of 1, so how about 2? And I'm going to plug these test points into what now? The derivative. So the derivative, not, not f, g prime evaluated at 1 half is, now let's look at it. So there it is at the top there, so this will be what? Uh, 1 half times 2 is 1, multiplied by 1 plus 1 fourth. And right, I'm using this term right here. And then 1 minus 1 half, that's 1 half. And then 1 plus 1 half, that is 3 halves, divided by uh, 1, 1 half to the, to the 4 is what? 1 eighth? So 1 plus 1 eighth to the 2. Okay, so that, that looks like a pretty awful expression to attempt to evaluate, but actually none of that's necessary. Why, why don't we actually need to evaluate this? The only thing that matters is that it's positive, right? That's the product and quotient of several positive terms. So it's positive. So what does that mean about the function in this region? It is increasing, right? So it increases in that region. Okay, which is good because that's what we were hoping, right? Because we're hoping t equal to 1 is a maximizer. Okay, so then let's test in the other position. Okay, the other position says that we can test at 2. So in this case, we will get uh, 4 because that's 2 times 2. And then 1 plus t squared, so that will be 5. And then multiplied by 1 minus 2 is negative 1. And then 1 plus 2, that's 3. Okay, and then this will be uh, 1 plus 2 to the 4. Wait, 2 to the 4? Oh, so this is wrong, right? Y'all got to catch me when I make a mistake. This should have been 1 16th, but that doesn't make any difference. Okay, so then 17 squared. So then now, you don't need to evaluate this expression because you can see it is a product which is certainly what? It is certainly negative. And that is all that matters. So then... It's negative. So tell me about the critical number t is 1. What kind of thing is it? A maximizer. Okay. So this tells you that t equal to 1 is a maximizer. So what is that saying? That's saying that if you have a look at the original graph, if you have a look at the original graph, the secant line, the the optimal secant line is when you go from t is negative 1 to t is positive 1. That is the secant line with the most slope. Okay, so then, yes? Okay, so it's a good question. So, so the, the, the discussion of this question is over, but now here's another thing. I could say, what if I have an algebraic expression that looks like this. f of x is n of x over d of x. Incidentally, why am I choosing the names n of x and d of x? For numerator and denominator. So what if I have an expression? If I want to solve that the quotient is equal to 0, right, the only way the quotient can be 0 is when the numerator is 0 and the denominator isn't 0. So this is when the numerator 
is zero and the denominator is not zero. So then the denominator in the previous question was never zero. So in order to find where the derivative was zero, I just needed to find where the numerator was zero. Any other questions? <coughs> Okay, so then, no questions about this. So any specific questions before I go back to the beginning of time? Okay, so then I'd like to make one mention. Right, so then this, this thing that I'm going to say is not going to be tested. It's not going to be tested specifically, but you are free to use it. Okay, and it is to say this. This thing right here, this thing right here that we did on the last question, where we said, uh, if you have a critical number, if you have a critical number, t is whatever, or x is whatever, x is a, and if you have a slope chart that is like this, okay, so if you have a critical number at a, and the slope chart is telling you that the function increases to a and decreases from a and f of x is continuous <coughs> well yeah I'll say that'll be enough it's continuous at x is a so if all of these things are true this tells you that f has a relative max at x is a Right, so then that is for the maximum one. Now I could take this picture and turn it upside down, and then I could say it doesn't have a relative max there, it has a relative min. Okay, so then <coughs> that's using first derivative information. So then now the second derivative, we're not gonna be talk we're not gonna be testing the second derivative on this exam. Okay, it's not gonna be on the exam. But there is something pretty interesting that I'd like for you to see, and that is this. Okay, so how about this? this thing versus this thing. Where the second derivative is concerned, this one is said to be concave what? Down, right? Like a, like a frown. Right? Concave down like a frown. And this one is concave up like a cup. Right? Wonderful. So then if these, if these are uh, graphs of a function f, graphs of a function f, then I have a question for you. At this point right here, at the top and at the bottom, right, that's where the first derivative is what? Zero. Right, so the first derivative is zero for both of these. So then, in a sense, you know, the first derivative is really great because it tells you something really important is happening right there. Something really important is, is happening. But, you know, for the problem that's at hand, right, it may be something that's really excellent or maybe something that's really bad, right? If I say, maximize the profit, and you say, well, here it is. I maximize the profit right there where the derivative is zero. Uh, no, no, you didn't maximize the profit. You minimized the profit. Uh, you're fired. Okay, so then, but now, tell me. Here, this is a maximizer. What kind of concavity is here? It's concave down. So what will be true about the second derivative? It will be negative, right? So the second derivative is negative. And here, what will be true about the second derivative? It will be positive. So this little schematic here is telling you some, this is the second derivative test. The second derivative test tells you the following. If you have a critical number where the first derivative is zero, and also you, have, you can compute the second derivative, and you detect that the second derivative is negative, so a zero first derivative and a negative second derivative means that you are at a place that it has a horizontal tangent and concave down, so you are at a max. Okay? If you have a place where the first derivative is zero, a horizontal tangent, and the second derivative is positive, then you are at a place that is concave up. So that you are at a relative min. You're at a relative min. So this is the second derivative test. So then, you know, 
on the last question that we did, right, I used this. This is called the first derivative test because you're using information from the first derivative. This is called the second derivative test because you're using information from the second derivative. Either one of them is legitimate. Either one of them is a completely legitimate thing. So then now, the second derivative test, you know, considering the uh, question, there was a question on the take-home quiz. I said, here is a quadratic. f of x is ax squared plus bx plus c. Well, the first derivative, the first derivative is 2ax plus b, and the second derivative is 2a. Well, the only critical number is where the first derivative is 0, which is at x is negative b over 2a. Right? It has exactly one critical number. Okay. So then, is it a maximizer or is, is it a minimizer? Well, that depends entirely. You can look at it now from the second derivative point of view. Right, if the second derivative, if 2a is positive, then it has positive concavity, and it is a, which one, minimizer or maximizer? A minimizer. Okay, if 2a is negative, then it has negative concavity, so that it is a minimizer. Okay? Uh, maximizer. <laughs> maximizer, thank you. <coughs> okay, good. So does everybody see that, that question now in light of the second derivative? Okay, good. So let's go back to the beginning. Back to the very beginning. <coughs> so what do we do? So we had a question that was, here is a limit. Use the epsilon and delta definition to show that this limit is true. So does everybody remember that, that such a question type exists? <laughs> Okay, so then let's, uh, let's look at one. Let's look at the one that was on the quiz. The one that was on the quiz was the limit as x goes to 2 of 5x squared plus 3x minus 8 is 18. So then now let's back up just a minute and, and have some facts. So first off, the thing that's being limited is a polynomial. It's a polynomial, and it belongs to the category of functions called elementary functions. So elementary functions you know because I have told you and you are allowed to use as a fact that elementary functions are continuous everywhere on their domain. They are. So then now, this function, if you are computing the limit of a function that is continuous at that point, then what is true at that point? Computing a limit is the same thing as evaluating, right? Computing a limit is the same as evaluation. So. Does this make sense? What do you get if you plug in 2? You get 10, uh, no, you get 20 plus 6, which is 26, minus 8 is 18. So you know that this is a true statement. But what you need to do is you, you need to use the definition of limit to show that this is a true statement. OK, so then the definition of limit is for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists delta greater than zero such that mm, on this question it will be zero less than x minus two in absolute value less than delta implies that the absolute value of 5x squared plus 3x minus 8 minus 18 is less than epsilon. Okay, so then that's because, that's because the statement, the statement is more generally that zero is less than x minus c is less than delta implies that f of x minus l is less than epsilon, right? But in this question, f of x is the polynomial and l is what? The limit, 18. Okay. So then every, the solution to all of these questions for the rest of your life, if you're a math major, you'll go through many, many more of these. Every solution to a question like this that says use the definition starts with the following sentence. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. And it always starts like that because the definition of limit is adversarial. It's adversarial because it says, okay, 
it has to work for every epsilon I give you. So I say, how about this epsilon? And you say, that's fine if you use that epsilon. You can use this delta right here. And this argument has to be able to proceed for, for infinity, right? So I say, okay, you did that epsilon. How about, how about this epsilon? And then you come back and you say, that epsilon's fine too, as long as you use this delta. And so long as you can continue this argument indefinitely, then the, the limit exists. Okay, so you start out with f of x minus l, minus l. So in this question, that will be 5x squared plus 3x, and then minus 8, minus 18. So that's minus 26. Is that right? <coughs> I hope so. So then now, this, this, I need to factor this expression. So, you know, you look at that quadratic and you say, oh man, it's got a leading, fa I've got a leading factor of 5. There's no way I'm going to be able to factor this. No, 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 no. Because, because, what is certainly a factor here? X minus 2 is a factor, right? X minus 2 is a factor because that's what we said, right? If you plug in 2, what do you get? You get 0. And therefore, by the fundamental theorem of algebra, which you, is something you knew before this class, x minus 2 has to be a factor. So if that is a factor, then the other one you can just observe, right? So then the leading term in the other factor has to be 5x, okay? And then I need the product of the other term and negative 2 to be negative 26, so then 5x plus 13. And then is that right? And the answer is yes, it's right. Okay, it's right. You could foil it out and check. Okay, so any question about how we got here? So x minus 2 multiplied by 5x plus 13. So what's happening is, is that this term that I'm underlining in green, you have control over that term. That's the term you have control over, right? We're having an argument. I'm saying, what about this epsilon? And you say, you could use this delta. The reason why you're going to be able to produce a delta is because you have control over x minus 2. You're t we're computing a limit as we're going to x minus 2, which means you can say you are as close to 2 as you wish. You can get as close as you wish. Okay, so then, <coughs> now is at the point in the argument you say, okay, because I can be as close to 2 as I wish, I'm going to assume that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1. Right, you can say it's less than any positive number. If pi is your favorite positive number, then use pi. Okay, I, I encourage you to use 1 because that will be the algebraically simplest case. So then now, I can drop the absolute value and say that negative 1 is less than x minus 2 is less than 1 because that's the meaning of the absolute value. The expression x minus 2 is between negative 1 and 1. And what I want to do now is I want to turn the expression x minus 2 into the expression 5x plus 13. So the first thing I'm going to do to get there is to say that, well, I'll, I will add 2 and say that 1 is less than x is less than 3. And so now I have 1x, but I want 5x, so I'll multiply by 5 and say that 5 is less than 5x is less than 15. So I have 5x now, but I want 5x plus 13, so I'll add 13 and say that, uh, what, 18 is less than 5x plus 13. 13 is less than 28. Okay, so does everybody see how I got here? So what I'm doing here in this, this argument is I'm saying, I have control over x minus 2, and I'm going to use this to assert control over the other term. Okay, so then what, what this is saying is that I guarantee you that, that the other term is between 18 and 28. It can't be any bigger, it can't be any smaller. So then now you can say that, well, in that case, the absolute value of 5x plus 13 is less than 28. <coughs> it's less than 28. So now, the answer is that delta is going to be whichever is smaller. 1 or what? Epsilon over 28. Okay, so then where did the 1 come from? This 1. If you had chosen pi, then it would be the minimum of pi and something else. Where did the 28 come from? This 28. 
Okay? So any question about this? <clears throat> okay, so then the reason why it works, if you want to see the reason why it works, then review the things on YouTube because I explained why this one works several times already. Okay, so any question about this? <clears throat> okay, good. So then another thing, <clears throat> another thing to see is, for example, just to remind you that such a question type exists, how about the limit as x goes to 3 of this expression? x squared plus 3x minus 18 over x squared minus 9. Okay, so if you evaluate the numerator, what do you think you get? Zero. If you evaluate the denominator, what do you get? Zero. Right. So what happens if you if you compute this limit? The universe ends, destroys, over? No, 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 no. So if these are polynomials, right? And because you're plugging in three, you get a zero in each one of them. That means it is a fact that each one of them has a factor of x minus three in it. So they factor in this way. So this is x minus three multiplied by x plus six and then divided by x minus 3 times x plus 3. Ah, so then you can see why you're getting 0 over 0. So what can you do in this limit? You can cancel. What if, what if you were not computing the limit? Could you cancel? No, you could not cancel. You could not cancel because if you do cancel, the canceled expression, Right, the new expression after cancellation would, would have an evaluation at 3. You would be able to evaluate at 3. Okay, but you cannot evaluate the original expression at 3, and this is one of the things that we're trying to undo. Right? Secondary school taught you that you can just cancel any old time, any time you want. No, you cannot cancel any old time. You can cancel inside of the limit. That's when you can cancel. Okay, good. So then how about this one? There was another question, the limit as x goes to 0 of the sine of 3x over the sine of x. So this one was mildly entertaining. It required you to remember that the limit as x goes to 0 of the sine of x over x, right? This is something that we demonstrated for you. It is equal to what? 1, right? That's something that you have. Okay, so then what I want to do is I want to turn this limit into some of these. Okay, into some of these. So then what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say that, well, this is equal to the limit as x goes to 0 of <coughs> sine of 3x over 1 multiplied by 1 over the sine of x. Okay. So, so first off, I cannot just evaluate this expression because it would be 0 over 0. Okay, so then now I have these two things and I want to turn them both into something that looks like this. Right? So sine of blah over blah. This is sine of 3x over 1. So what is missing in the denominator for this? A 3x is missing. So then I can perform the following surgery on the problem and say that this is the limit as it goes to 0 of the sine of 3x divided by 3x. But if I just divide by 3x, that changes the problem. So I can't just divide. I must also multiply. Right? So then now, I divide and multiply by 3x. I haven't changed the problem. OK, good. So then now, this one right, is just the reciprocal of this. Right? So then sine of blah over blah. Here I have sine of x. So what's missing right here? an x. So I multiplied by x, but I can't just multiply by x, I must also divide by x. So I haven't changed the problem now. Now you can see I multiply, I, I have this x hanging out and that x hanging out. So they cancel. So this is equal to the limit as x goes to 0 of the sine of 3x over 3x multiplied by 3 multiplied by x over sine of x because I have canceled the extra x's. So then now each one of these we know the limit. What is the limit of this one? It is 
1. What is the limit of 3? 3. What is the limit of this? It should be 1 over 1. And so I'll write that, 1 over 1, which is 1. So what is the limit of this altogether? 3. Okay, besides this sine ratio, sine of x over x, there was another one involving cosine. What was the one involving cosine? The limit as x goes to 0 of 1 minus the cosine of x over x is equal to what? 0. Okay, so are we running out of time? Everybody's getting shuffly. <coughs> Almost. We still have plenty of time to go over one more. Okay, so that now that you've had time to think about it, is there anything you want to see? <laughs> What's going to be on the exam? Wonderful. Okay, so uh, maybe we won't go over the exam, but, <laughs> but we'll go over, uh, how about this one? <clears throat> okay, so here's a good question. On the quiz, I gave you this question. I said, okay f of x is the following piecewise defined function, a squared x squared minus 4ax plus 6 when x is less than or equal to 1 and it is 4a minus 9x when x is greater than 1. Okay, so now a is a constant. A is a constant. So for a given value of A, what is this first thing here? It's going to be a, it's graph, I mean to say. How will its graph appear? A parabola, right? So it's a parabola. Okay, that's what, that's what the first part is. And what is this thing for a fixed value of A? A line, right? So it's like I'm taking, I'm taking two graphs, a parabola and a line like so. So somehow, as I change the value a, right, they, they meet or they don't meet or whatever. Okay, great. So then the instruction was find the values of a. Find the values of a so that this function is continuous everywhere. So first off, where is this function certainly continuous? Everywhere except one, right? because the individual definitions are elementary. So then, away from 1, the function is continuous. So what we need, so the first thing you need to say is that f is continuous for x not equal to 1. Right, it's continuous everywhere else because those pieces are elementary functions. As for 1, as for 1, okay, what we need To make f of x continuous at x is 1, what we need, we need the evaluation. f evaluated at 1 has to be equal to what? The limit uh, at 1, the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x. Right? That's the requirement. A function is continuous if evaluation is the same thing as limitation at that point. So then now, <coughs> in order for this limit exi to exist, okay, on, in general, the way you do it is you test the left limit and the right limit. So from the left, from the left, the limit as x goes to 1 from the left of f of x, because I am explicitly saying that I'm approaching from the left, then I am allowed to use one of the definitions. I'm allowed to select one of them. Which one am I allowed to select? The first one. So it is a squared x squared minus 4ax plus 6. Now, can you compute the limit of that thing? Oh, yes, right? It's elementary. That's the same as plugging in. So this is what? a squared minus 4a plus 6. Okay, that's what the limit is for a, for any, oops, for a given value of a. From the right, right, the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of f of x is the limit as x goes to 1 from the right of, I can choose an expression, right? Because I'm saying I'm approaching from the right, I can say that 
I can select 4a minus 9x. So can I evaluate that? Sure I can, 4a minus 9. So for a fixed value of a, the limit from the left is that quadratic, and the limit from the right, that, that quadratic in a, and the limit from the right is that linear thing in a. So I want them to be the same. That's what I want. I want to select values of a so that they are the same. Algebraically, what does this mean? Set them equal to each other. So now we solve a squared minus 4a plus 6 is equal to 4a minus 9. Okay, so then that is a squared uh, minus 8a and then plus 15. So does this factor? Yeah, it factors into a minus 3 multiplied by a minus 5 is 0. So the solutions are a is 3 or a is 5. So if you, if you choose a is 3 or a is 5, then the line and the parabola meet each other. They're continuous. How about, here's another question. Now, I'm not going to actually solve it. I'm not going to solve it because there's not enough time to solve it. But here's another question. What if I was to give you a question like it, like this one, where I say, I am, I'm going to take some quadratic with unknown parameters, A, and another line with unknown parameters in it. And I want, I want the corresponding function to be not just continuous, but differentiable there. Not just continuous, but differentiable. So let's imagine here. Right, so this question was, I want you to glue together a parabola and a line so that they're continuous. So imagine a new question. I want you to glue together a parabola and a line so that they are differentiable. So look at what the picture would look like. So, you know, maybe the, maybe the parabola is like this. And then now, at this place, it switches. Right, at that place, it switches to, the, to a line so that it would have to look like, like that or so. So imagine that it's actually very smooth right there. So it's a very smooth transition between the parabola and the line. So this is two requirements now, right? It's two requirements. So on the last question, what you had to solve, you had to solve the equation <coughs> if this one was, if this side was, Oh, come on. If this side was g of x and this side was h of x, right, then what you needed if this was, if this was uh, x is equal to 1, what you had to do is you had to solve the equation g of 1 is h of 1. Algebraically, you had to solve that. And there were two solutions in the previous question. That is enough to make it continuous. That is to say that it meets left and right. right? You don't have to jump to go from one to the other. Okay, but if you want it to be smooth, if you want it to be differentiable there, then not only do you need to solve this equation, not only do, does, do the functions left and right have to agree, what also has to agree? The derivatives, right? The slopes left and right must also agree. So then you would also have to solve this equation. G prime evaluated at 1 has to be H prime evaluated at 1. Because what that's saying is that if you were to find a solution to this equation, then the slopes would agree. Okay, so then now I want you to consider these two equations. This one right here, the first one says, you know, in the previous question, that would say it's continuous. The second one would say that the slopes, the slopes agree. Those together are enough to say that the function is differentiable. What about a function, right, if you just make the slopes agree? Can you think of any function where the slopes agree from the left and right that is not continuous? <laughs> ah, I said it. That is not differentiable. A function that, w that isn't continuous, right? So, for example, this one, right? So then here's a, f a function with that slope, and here's a function with the same slope. Right? Is that function differentiable? No, it's not differentiable there because it's not continuous there, but the slope from the left is the same as the slope from the right. So you would need to solve those two equations simultaneously to obtain a differentiable result. So, any questions concerning all these things? <clears throat> a 
Okay, so then there's going to be two, two sections of the exam, the computer section and the written section. The written section is going to be about 60 or 70 percent. The computational portion on the machine will be the balance. Is, does that answer your question? Other questions? Okay, yes? The testing center, you're going to be able to go to it uh, over the course of a, a few days. It's going to be, you'll have one hour when you're in there, but you'll be able to do it on Friday, or you'll be able to do it on Saturday, or you'll be able to do it on Monday. <coughs> okay, and the written exam will be at the, at the scheduled time at 8 p.m. on Friday. And I'd like to emphasize one more time that that was not my selection, that was someone else's selection and I'll see you there on Friday. Yes? And no, the com computer part is in the testing center. The written part is taking place. Did you get your exam ticket yesterday? It's written on there. <coughs> Yes? 